thanks for tuning in to the Oxygen Alliance YouTube channel where we share the concentrated talk virtual meeting hosted every Thursday from 2 to 3 p.m. Central African time. In the talk, we discuss different aspects of oxygen concentrate assessment, use and maintenance. And please don't forget to subscribe and hit that notifications bell. Hi everyone, and thank you for joining us for the last Oxygen Talk of the year. So normally we have our Concentrator Talk, which is brought to you by the Oxygen Alliance, which is focused on repair and maintenance of oxygen concentrators. Once a month, we do a uh, session where we invite experts to join us for anything related to oxygen, and they come and present to us for 45 minutes, and we have a question and answer session. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce the team from CARE, one of the oldest manufacturers of oxygen concentrators in the U.S. We have with us today uh, Barry Hassett, who is the Vice President for Global Marketing and has 25 years of experience working in healthcare marketing and development in a variety of sectors, including orthopedics, vascular surgery, oncology, and respiratory. He has been with CARE for the past three years. We have Troy Baker, who is the Global Technical Service Manager for CARE and has been in the industry for the past 26 years. And we have Cliff Herr, who is a Technical Service Training Supervisor with 12 years of experience working in the industry. We are really excited to have you all here today. Uh, it's an early start from the US side, so we appreciate that. And with that, I will turn it over to you. We are ready to learn and listen. Uh, let's see, Troy, uh, we'll need slides from uh, Barry. Those are not in this, I just realized. Oh, the one I sent you? Um, sorry, okay. Uh, they weren't in that folder, sorry, I just realized that. Uh, sent it to you yesterday. Um, Bear with me a sec. I thought you had it. Uh, I was in that folder. Sorry. It's what I was looking for. There we are. No, but you. I, you... Yeah, I got it. You do? Yeah, I got the uh, PowerPoint or the uh, PDF. There we go. Let's see if I share that screen. And let's go share window. And. There it is, and share. There we go. We're here today to talk about the CARE New Life and uh, Good morning, everybody. I, I don't know if it was mentioned, but uh, I'm having some audio issues this morning. So uh, I, I'm working off of hand signals here. I appreciate the thumbs up, Troy. Um, first of all, I want to thank the Oxygen Alliance for inviting us to present this morning. Um, uh, we're very excited to have this opportunity and to speak directly with you. Uh, we were asked this morning to discuss our New Life Intensity 10 device. Um, next slide. Uh, the New Life Intensity 10 is a, um, uh, is a 10 liter per minute um, oxygen therapy device. Um, uh, it actually has a, a wide range of settings up to 10 liters per minute and delivers med medical oxygen over that, uh, over that range. Um, it is a widely used device, um, has been on the market for uh, more, than, more than 10 years and has an excellent track record. Um, and uh, at the initial outbreak of the COVID pandemic, was um, in significant demand uh, globally. Um, it's a low power consumption device, which I know is, um, is advantageous um, in many of the markets that you all operate in. High pressure has a very, very robust design. Um, it is known for its good quality um, and for its longevity in the market and um, operates um, very well in a wide variety of, uh, of environmental conditions. Um, does not require a lot of maintenance, but of course that's 
what we're here to discuss today is to provide support to you all in terms of um, uh, maintaining the device, servicing the device, and ensuring optimum performance uh, throughout the life of the device. Next slide, please. <clears throat> um, I did briefly want to mention um, an accessory that is available for use. Um, it may or may not be something that you all are, um, are familiar with, um, but we have a SureFlow device which is compatible with the New Life Intensity 10. And that SureFlow device um, actually allows multiple uh, patients to be treated off of a, uh, off of a single oxygen concentrator. Um, you can see from the picture um, there are actually five uh, five flow valves on the uh, on the SureFlow uh, SureFlow connector. Um, so you could actually treat up to five patients off a single New Life Intensity 10. Um, to be clear, um, the uh, the total capacity for the device is 10 liters per minute. So uh, if you were to put five patients on it the um, maximum that you could do on uh, would be a total of 10 liters per minute. So for example, that would be two liters per minute on five patients, or um, you could do three, two, 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 one, um, any combination that would add up to a total of, uh, of 10 liters per minute. Next slide, please. Um, these, this is just a summary of the specs of the, of the New Life Intensity. Um, again, the settings are from 2 to 10 liters per minute. Um, it delivers medical grade oxygen at uh, an average of about 90% pure oxygen. Um, the output pressure is 20 PSI. Um, uh, the sound level is um, under 60 decibels, uh, about 58, uh, 58 decibels. You can see a wide variety of um, operating environmental temperatures, um, both from an operational perspective and from a storage perspective, um, operates uh, reliably under a um, wide variety of, of altitudes. And as we mentioned earlier, is a relatively um, low power consumption device when you consider the overall output of the device. Um, so just wanted to provide that overview. Uh, this presentation, in, uh, it's actually quite a comprehensive presentation. And to get through in the required time um, is going to require Cliff to um, uh, move quickly through some of the slides. Um, but the presentation is going to be made available to you. Um, and as well, as you'll see here in a minute, uh, we have a variety of resources that are available to you online. Um, that can uh, provide uh, useful service and support information. And uh, in addition to that, we do have a technical service team that is on call and available to, uh, to answer questions at any time. Um, so with that, and to keep the focus of our time on uh, the primary purpose, I'm gonna turn this over to Cliff so he can review the um, uh, service and maintenance support. Uh, which I know is what you all are interested in this morning. Cliff? All righty, let me change my page. There we go. Yeah. Did I share the right page on this one? Yes. Yep. There we go. Yep, we're good. Make sure I was on the right one. Sorry about that. All right. Once again, as Barry stated, uh, Tech Service is here to answer your calls. Uh, we're here Monday through Friday, 8 30 a.m. to 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Call us at 1-800-482-2473, uh, or you can email us at techservice.globalcareinc.com. That is really important. When you when you call in or you email in, we will need the serial number from the unit. That is one of the most important things. That way we know which unit you're working with, the unit that's sitting in front of you right now. Uh, we've had some variances on these units through the years, and we want to make sure that the unit that we're giving you information on, we're giving you information on the proper one. Uh, so once again, if you call in to this number or if you email in, please include the serial number for the unit you're working with. Our Knowledge Center, there's a large volume of information available at our Knowledge Center, a very valuable website. Go to careinc.com, C-A-I-R-E, inc.com once you're there you will click on the uh, oxygen therapy link 
From there, you will go to the provider menu, and then you'll get a drop down menu to choose Knowledge Center, or you can choose in the upper right hand corner to search for Knowledge Center. Once you get into the Knowledge Center, you'll be able to find uh, cut sheets for all of our units, uh, <clears throat> user manuals, uh, technical manuals, uh, accessory parts such as that, uh, filters, tools that are required for working on the unit. All of those will be listed on that page. In addition to that, there will also be med tips and service bulletins. So if we've released any information about a unit, a uh, way to troubleshoot uh, different, if we've made a change to the unit, those will be in our service bulletins on that page. Uh, there's also a parts list. You click on the unit you're working with, like for instance, the Intensity 10, going through the Intensity or New Life family, click on that. When it opens, find the unit you're working with. You can choose between the New Life Elite, the Intensity 8, or the Intensity 10. Uh, choose the, uh, the unit type that you're working on. You'll go to the bubble sequence, find the part, and you'll be able to locate the uh, individual part number that you're looking for. Uh, part numbers are readily available from tech service. So if you call tech service or email tech service, they will get you a part number and it will be the most current part number available. Uh, the website, sometimes it can take a, a few days once we make a change to the system to appear in the website. So if you feel you need to, you can contact tech service directly and they will be able to assist you with getting the most current part number for the unit. We move into the new life unit to the intensity. All right, the, new, the new life intensity <clears throat> has available only on the new life intensity model a dual flow option. So you're able to have two flow meters on the same unit. There would be two separate flow meters. You'd have your primary flow meter that would lo be located on the left hand side here. That is the primary flow meter. The output would be here. It's primary outlet section in front of the unit, but you can also have a secondary flow meter on the side over here and the outlet is located here. This unit can put out a, any combination up to 10 liters per minute, minimum flow of two, maximum flow of 10. So it has to be in that range. You, it will come with two 10 liter flow meters, but you cannot flow 20 liters per minute out of this unit. You can only flow 10. So you can have one setting at two liters per minute and the other one setting at six or one at three, the other at seven, any combination, as long as it does not exceed 10 liters per minute. <clears throat> now this is the only unit we offer with a pediatric option. You can order a secondary pediatric flow meter. You would order this flow meter separately once you receive the unit, you would remove the secondary flow meter, install the pediatric flow meter in its place. And as long as the pediatric flow meter is on the unit and functioning, it is required that you allow two liters per minute to blow off from the primary flow meter. Remember, the unit requires a minimum flow of two liters per minute coming from the unit. <clears throat> the maximum is 10, but the minimum is two. If you turn it below two, the unit will back up pressure inside the unit and cause issues, and you will start getting alarms. Here we we'll see the front of the unit, the alarm panel on the front of the unit. <clears throat> uh, the alarm panel, you'll have the oxygen monitoring indicator here, the O2 with the down arrow, letting you know that the O2 levels have dropped below 85%, plus or minus three. Next, you'll have a power failure alarm. So if the unit is plugged in and operating and it loses power coming to the unit, you'll get an indicator here. And any type of general malfunction alarm would show up in this section here. So if it's low pressure, high pressure, that would appear in this area here. Uh, some benefits of using the New Life Intensity Models, 20 PSI outlet pressure. Uh, so you can run a lot of items on it, nebulizers, venturi masks, such as that. And you're able to nebulize medication using oxygen so the high pressure makes it very handy you can also run a 200 foot uh, extension on the unit we'll move into the components now looking at the front of the unit itself you know, I have your general 
uh, components, the flow meter, hour meter, a circuit breaker for resetting, the on-off switch for turning the unit off and on, humidifier bottle recess, once again, our LED alarm panel, and some operating instructions. On the back, there's a power cord. The exhaust for this unit is out of the bottom of the unit, so it comes out where the casters are located on the bottom. <clears throat> there's quarter turn fasteners for taking the side panels off. And the filter on the back is the intake, air intake filter, gross particle filter. This is all, where all air enters into the unit. So as long as the unit's turned on, the air is moving through this filter on the back of the unit. PSA process occurs inside of the unit. The heat and the nitrogen are, are exhausted out of the bottom of the unit. So the exhaust are down here on the bottom. Because of that, you need to make sure you maintain plenty of space around the unit. Uh, the unit does be, it needs to be able to breathe in and to breathe out. So you have to allow that air to, from the atmosphere, from the room, the ambient air to come into the unit. And also you have to allow that air to exhaust out of the unit, the heat and the nitrogen to be exhausted out of the unit. If you do not, the unit will go into an alarm mode. Flow meter on the front of the unit. It does have a dual set of lines. It's, you can see it here in this image. There's especially down here at the bottom, you see they're kind of offset from each other. If you look into the flow meter and you see two sets of lines where you're trying to adjust, you're not looking at the right angle. You would have to adjust your head until you see one set of lines in the flow meter. Once you do that, you align to the center of the ball. That is the flow setting of the unit is the center of the ball. And for instance, this one is set, this unit is set to four liters per minute. So it's at the center of the ball. There's a circuit breaker on the unit, just above the power switch. There's a breaker that will trip if there's a high current condition. This will happen if the compressor stalls, uh, power surges, uh, power spikes, anything like that. There's an overload in the system. Uh, if it trips, the button itself will be extended in an outward position. It does not self-reset. You have to manually push that reset button to reset the uh, circuit breaker. There's an hour meter for keeping track of the hours that are on the unit. It has two settings. It has the basic time elapsed setting, which will show you the overall hours on the unit. And it also has an accumulated hours or TMR1 setting. Uh, you access that through this little pinhole on the top right corner of the hour meter. Press the button. It'll switch modes from the elapsed hours to the accumulated hours. And then you can keep track between visits to the patient on how many hours the unit has on it or whatever other function you would need that for in your system. Here's the internal components. So if we look at the front of the unit, if you were to remove the panel just under the power switch, remove that panel, you'll see behind there is the compressor. In the back, it's kind of hard to see right at the moment, but we'll see it shortly. There's a resonator along the back. The resonator acts as an intake noise muffler to cut down on the noise from the suction of the compressor where it's sucking air into the compressor. We have a capacitor located here that is used for starting and running the compressor. There's a temperature switch mounted inside the compressor housing that monitors the temperature inside of this area right here. If the temperature gets too high, it will turn off power to the compressor. This tube here is not marked, but this tube is connected to that resonator. So remember what I said, the intake resonator, that's where the air comes into the unit, acts as an intake muffler. The tube connects to the compressor. The intake is here. The compressed air comes out of the other end. It goes through a heat exchanger. Uh, there's fan blades on the end of the compressor. There's a fan in the background. It's constantly moving air in here to try to cool this. We want to cool the air as much as possible before we send it through this tube back to the sieve beds in the back of the unit. <clears throat> and it does have built-in casters on the bottom of the unit. Looking at the back of an intensity unit, we have on each side the two large cylinders. These are the sieve beds. These are the ones that do the PSA 
separation of oxygen and nitrogen. The nitrogen as the atmospheric air is fed from the compressor through this manifold into the beds, the atmospheric air or the beds strip the atmospheric air of nitrogen and allow the oxygen to pass through. So these beds will be are high and low pressure at any given time. High pressure is where we are taking the oxygen or the nitrogen and holding onto it, stripping it away, allowing the oxygen to pass through. And the low side will be when we're blowing that nitrogen back off through the exhaust out to the atmosphere. So we have a high and low side, and this will switch from side to side throughout the duration of operation of the unit. On the top left, we have a regulator that controls the outlet pressure of the unit. And we'll see how to adjust that shortly. There's an equalization valve. So this system is more efficient at high pressure. So when we build up high pressure in this bed, and then we lower the pressure in this bed to exhaust the nitrogen, we don't want to start off with a bed at zero PSI. So we use the equalization valve, to allow that pressure to build back up so that they're both high pressure when the next cycle kicks in. And that way the beds are more efficient. So we want high pressure to equalize out on both sides between cycles. We have a control board here in the center circuit board that controls all the operations of the unit. We have a DC uh, power converter for the cooling fan, and this cooling fan here. And at the bottom, we have the power cord and then the set of feed and waste valves. So you have a feed valve and a waste valve for this bed, and a feed valve and a waste valve for this bed. On the side of the unit, you can see the front here. So this is going to be on the looking from the front. This would be the right, uh, the right hand side. In the background, you see a mixing tank or product tank, as some people may refer to it. This is where we take the the oxygen that's coming from each bed. We put it into this tank, allow them to mix together, stabilize out, and then send out a stable flow out of the unit. Inside of here, we also have our first stage resonator. Uh, the Intensity 10 it has quite a large uh, comp uh, compressor in it. It creates a lot of suction noise, so we want to try to eliminate that. We added the first stage resonator along with the second stage resonator to try to deaden the noise before, uh, so it doesn't create such a large amount of noise in somebody's house. That first stage resonator does have a felt filter. This needs to be changed annually. This acts as a, basically as a gross particle filter for the resonator. And then in this location, there's several tubes, as you can see, but there is only one black tube. This black tube is the tube we use for measuring the operating pressure of the unit. There is also sitting loose in this area a blue tube. The blue tube is not used for anything in the field. Uh, if you connect the gauge to that and you contact us and say, I've got this blue tube, I have my gauge attached, and it shows 32 PSI, what does that mean? I'm going to tell you to take your gauge loose, seal that tube back up, and connect to the black tube, because the black tube is what we use for determining what the operating pressure is of the unit. The blue is used only for production and engineering. This capacitor located just above the compressor. This is what starts and runs the compressor. Uh, the compressor, if the capacitor is bad, it's, it's unplugged or if it's shorted out internally and something's wrong with it, <clears throat> your compressor will not start when you turn the unit on. So you turn the switch on, you'll hear the fan come on and nothing happens with the compressor. If it's bad or in a faulty state, could also keep tripping the circuit breaker. You turn a unit on, trips the breaker, you reset it, trips the breaker again, check your capacitor, it may be the issue. And then also, if the capacitor is bad, your compressor will run slow or stall. So if the unit is running and it starts hearing kind of a sputtering noise and stops and restarts, start looking at the capacitor. That would be the an indicator that you have a bad capacitor. Next, we have a thermal switch, thermal switch inside of the unit. That is what monitors the temperature inside of this uh, compressor box area. 
if the temperature gets above 73.9 degrees Celsius, uh, you'll start, the compressor will shut down. That little switch will shut the compressor down, turn the power off going to it, and you'll end up getting a low pressure alarm. So if your compressor shuts down intermittently and your the cooling fan in the back of the unit is still operating, uh, at that point you would start uh, looking at this item here as possibly being the issue. Here's the first stage resonator we spoke of a few moments ago, just acts as initial intake to the machine, helps to kind of deaden the sound. This filter should be replaced once again annually. Second stage resonator, this is the one that's located in the background behind the compressor. <clears throat> it's there just to deaden the noise of the suction of the compressor. If they can go bad, yes, it does happen. Symptoms of a faulty resonator is you're getting, when it goes bad, it restricts the flow of air going into the compressor. The way to test it is to disconnect the tube from the compressor. If the unit runs fine and your pressures, operating pressures are normal, with the um, resonator disconnected, then that indicates that you have a bad resonator. Replace the resonator. It's fairly simple. Have them place with two cable ties. Uh, just have to remove the compressor to get to it. Next, we have the solenoid valves. <clears throat> uh, solenoid valves, we have feed and waste for each side. So the feed valve, waste valve, one for each side, equalization valve. Feed feeds air into the beds, waste, waste the exhaust. Our sieve beds, as we discussed earlier, this is what separates the oxygen and the nitrogen. The one on each side, each one has their own feed and waste valves. If these go bad, you would end up with high pressure in your system or possibly low O2. Uh, mixing tank, these can go bad. As I said earlier, this is what mixes the oxygen from each bed together. Um, <clears throat> if you have a bad mixing tank, the number one thing is leaks. You would look for leaks around there. If there's leaks around the seams or anything, you need to replace it. Or if your O2 concentration fluctuates, this, this tank has a little bit of sieve in the bottom. If you connect your O2 meter to the output of the unit and it's reading 93, then 91, 93, 91, it's rapidly going back and forth between the two. And that's an indication that you have a bad mixing tank. Next, we have the pressure regulator. This regulates the pressure supplied to the flow meter. It ensures that you have a steady flow out of the unit. It's located just below the handle between the beds. It is adjustable. You pull out on the knob, rotate it, adjust the setting where you need it, and then lock it back in place. Indicators of a bad flow uh, uh, pressure regulator is the flow meter ball in the front of the unit starts bouncing more than a quarter of a liter per minute. So if that ball starts moving rapidly back and forth, at that point, you want to look at this regulator. It may need to be cleaned or replaced. Circuit board, this controls all the PSA cycles that operate throughout the unit, uh, detects pressure through the sensors here, and activates any alarms as needed. Cabinet fan, cabinet fan is what we use for cooling. This pulls the room air into the unit, pulls it across all the components, and cools them down. Symptoms of a bad fan would be that the fan is not turning or if it's noisy, if it's clogged with a, a lot of animal hair or something like that, that would determine uh, let you know that the fan is bad, needs to be replaced. If the uh, thermal switch in the compressor area keeps shutting down the compressor, you may need to look at this fan, make sure the fan is functional. Uh, 2018, we did go from a single LED to a three LED system. Uh, changed some of the the uh, view of the unit. So originally, you just had the single LED. It would light up if there's an alarm. Now we have multiple LEDs to give you ideas of what is going on with the unit. Now, the alarm conditions for a three LED unit, when you're looking at the front, as I stated earlier, we have our O2 monitoring alarm. If the O2 levels drop below, Around 82%, the alarm goes off. You get the indicator light. Uh, if, it, then, uh, if you lose power while the unit is functioning and plugged in, 
you'll get the indicator here letting you know that you've lost power. Uh, for that, you would need to find an alternate power source, try a different receptacle. Um, maybe if you have it on, you should operate these on extension cords or power strips. But if you do have one to plug into one like that, check the, the power strip. It's got a reset button or on off switch, make sure they're not turned off. Uh, if you have it plugged into the wall directly, wall receptacle, try a different receptacle, test that receptacle with a, a lamp or something. If the lamp turns on, the unit should turn on. Then at the bottom, general malfunction. Uh, it depends on what's wrong with the unit, which alarm shows up here. You know, what the light here, when you get this light, you'll have to go and do troubleshooting and go through the unit. We'll cover that shortly. Routine maintenance. We have the air intake filter on the back of the unit. The user should be cleaning that weekly. Make sure that they do not put that filter on while it is wet. It needs to be completely dry before they put it back on. The first thing that the air touches when it comes in off the filter is the control board and circuit board. And we don't want moisture directly onto that. Once a year, replace the first stage resonator. And the product filter inside of the unit is designed to last the life of the unit. You don't need to replace the product filter as a lifetime filter. And care does not require any kind of preventive maintenance to the unit. As long as the unit is operating in spec, it's not alarming, anything's going on with the unit, there's nothing wrong with the unit. There's no need to work on it other than changing filter as needed. All right, test equipment that you'll need for operating, working on the unit. <clears throat> you'll need a pressure test gauge. That is, as you see here, this gauge. You'll need an adapter. The adapter threads into the back of this. And then a tube that we'll see shortly for checking the outlet pressure of the unit. And then a list of assorted tools that you would need for operating, working on the unit. Remember, when you're operating on these units, when you open them, you are exposing the board, the circuit board. So you need to be using ESD protection to keep from putting any type of electrostatic discharge into the circuit board and causing damage on the board. Here's some operational uh, check steps for you as a provider. Uh, <clears throat> power failure alarm, you just, while the unit's running, you unplug it, you'll get that alarm that shows you that you've lost power while operating. Your O2 concentration test, turn the unit on, make sure there's no humidifier or anything like that connected to the unit, connect your O2 meter to the unit, and check the O2 outlet of the unit. It is important that you give it about five minutes of time to warm up before you start testing this. Otherwise, you're going to get incorrect readings. So you need about five minutes of warm up before this test happens. As we discussed earlier, there's a pressure test port on the side of the unit. This pressure test port has a little, it may have a cap or it may just be a folded tube. Either way, you'll cut the cable tie loose, open the tube, you'll connect a gauge to it, the gauge kit we mentioned a minute ago. You'll turn the unit on. After you've connected the gauge, turn the unit on, let the unit run for about five minutes, let it warm up. Once it's warmed up, watch this gauge. The pressure is going to swing from a low setting to a high setting. And it'll keep going back and forth. Keep an eye on those numbers. See what your low level is, see what your high level is. They should fall within this range, depending on which unit you're working with. <clears throat> for example, here we'll take the intensity 10. The lowest pressure you can see is 10 PSI. The highest pressure you can see is 38 PSI. So as long as it's within that range, it may be your low side is 16 and your high is 24. And then your next time it's 15. On the next unit, it's 15 and 31. And next one, it's 11 and 22. Just as long as they don't go outside of these parameters. So you get 10 PSI on the low side, 38 on the high side, as long as your pressure stay within that range, that means the compressor is putting the air through the system the way it should. Now, if you have an issue, if one of these, if you're getting pressures that are out of uh, sync with these, first thing you want to do, check your resistance on your coils, make sure the coils are good. The coils are the square silver parts here. Unplug the unit, disconnect the wires, Connect your meter to it. Uh, if you're working with 220, 240 volt units, your equalization valve at the top of the unit would be 440 ohms. Your feed and waste valves here at the bottom 
these would all be around 3220. 30, uh, these are plus or minus 10 on both sets. Once again, make sure the unit is turned off, unplugged, disconnect your wires, check your resistance right here on the coil, make sure the coil is reading like it should. As long as it's reading like it should, the next thing we want to check, we can see if the, the wiring in the circuit board is giving the proper signal. To do that, you'll do a magnetic test. And all you want to do is take something like a, uh, here they're using a, uh, a center punch. You can use a paper clip, anything metal like that. Plug the unit in, turn it on, remove the cap from the coils, and then you can take that uh, whatever your metal object would be, be it a screwdriver or a paper clip, you hold it over top of the coil, that center pin right here on the coil, and every time the coil magnetizes, it'll pull that paper clip or screwdriver down against the coil. When it runs through the cycle and the coil turns off, it'll pull loose. So you'll sit there and you'll feel it pull down and release pull down and release throughout the cycle and as long as it's doing that it's pulling down and releasing pull down and releasing then we know the circuit board is sending a signal to the coil and that signal is making it all the way to the wire into the coil so you're able to check the board and the wires at the same time <clears throat> and along with that and along with checking the resistance you've taken and eliminated all those problems for me a potential issue of something wrong with the unit Next thing you want to check is the outlet pressure of the unit. For that, you would connect the tool we mentioned earlier, uh, connect that to the outlet of the unit, turn the flow ball as, or the flow knob as far as it'll go, open the flow meter as far as it'll go, and then you want to adjust the pressure regulator to where this reads 20 psi on the gauge. And you have to use this tool. You cannot uh, deadhead it or anything like that. This tool is designed with a little bleed off orifice that makes sure the unit has that flow bleeding off like it should. So you have to use the proper tool for checking the outlet pressure of the unit. And for the intensity model, your outlet pressure should be set at 20 PSI. <clears throat> if it's not adjusted to that, it can affect the O2 outlet of the unit, or the O2 output of the unit. Troubleshooting, our basic troubleshooting steps. Turn the unit on, make sure the power is on. Check your uh, operating pressure, make sure it's correct. You see what those numbers are, record those. Make sure your outlet pressure is 20 PSI. Turn your flow meter down to the uh, desired indicated flow. Make sure your flow meter's ball is stable. It's not moving too much. Put your thumb over the outlet of the unit, make sure it drops all the way to zero. If it doesn't go to zero, that means the unit has a leak internally. Look for a leak. Then connect your O2 analyzer to it and verify your O2 analyzer levels are reading correctly. <clears throat> now, a, 3D, a three LED unit, you turn the unit on, the compressor does not come on. The power failure light illuminates and you get an audible alarm. That could be that you're not getting no power from the electrical outlet. Try a different receptacle. Uh, the circuit breaker may have been tripped, so the breaker on the front of the unit, you may need to reset that. Could be a bad electrical connections. If you worked on it recently, go through the wires. And that's a key thing to think before you start removing things from the unit. If you have a, a, a phone with a camera, take a picture of the wiring. Otherwise, get a piece of paper and a pencil or a pen and do a rough schematic of where all the wires go so that you know you put them back in the proper location. Uh, you could have a faulty on-off switch. and It may not be sending power to everything it should. So it may send power to the fan but not to the compressor. So you may need to replace the on-off switch. It could be just a faulty circuit board. If you've checked all these and none of these resolve the issue, at that point, you're looking at the circuit board. Next up, the compressor shuts down periodically. Uh, it could be the improper location. Remember, we have to have airspace all the way around the unit, about 12 inches. Uh, there may be restricted airflow. There's nothing blocking the flow. The filter in the back is open and clear. 
if the cabinet fan is going bad, remember I said if it turns slow, doesn't turn uh, evenly or fast, then that could be an issue. It could have a defective thermal switch. Maybe a little switch that's located in the compressor housing area. That switch could be bad. The unit turns on, but the compressor does not start. There's an intermittent alarm and the cabinet fan is turning. Uh, it could be extreme cold start. I'm not sure of your location, but uh, we have to maintain within the operating specs of the unit. If it's too cold, the compressor is too cold, it will not start. Uh, if the compressor is shut down recently for overheating, like the cooling fan was bad and you had to put a new cooling fan in it, you're going to have to allow the compressor a couple hours to warm or cool down. Electrical connections for the compressor are wired incorrectly. Like I said, if you've worked on it recently, review your wiring. It could be a bad compressor or a capacitor. The capacitor itself may not be providing the power needed to start the compressor. And it may be a defective circuit board. The circuit board itself could possibly be bad. Next up, the audible alarm does not sound. So when you turn the unit on, once again, check your electrical connections, especially if you've worked on it. After that, it's possible that the uh, on-off switch itself is bad. That is what supplies power to the alarm. So if it's not supplying power, it may be bad. Or it may be a bad buzzer itself. So, Next, we have three LED units. The power failure light indicator comes on. You get the intermittent alarm. With the switch in the on position and your breaker keeps tripping for that you're going to look at electrical connections if you've worked on it go through it make sure you plug everything in the proper place next you could have a defective circuit breaker replace the breaker as needed possibly the capacitor itself may be bad and it could be the compressor or possibly the circuit board causing an issue with the unit <clears throat> Uh, next, we have low uh, low pressure. Low pressure, remember to disconnect that tube, the uh, resonator from the compressor. Let's see if the issue goes away. If it does, replace the resonator. If you have low pressure, of course, you'll look for leaks. Any type um, tube that may not have gotten connected back in place, check that. So if you get low pressure on your pressure swing gauge, start looking for leaks. What causes low pressure? Could be one of the valves not cycling properly. Go through and do the checks on the valves, like we said. Check the resistance. Check the magnetic pool. Make sure everything's functioning properly. If that doesn't resolve the issue, then likely you're looking at a compressor possibly worn out or needs to be replaced or rebuilt. Now, if the pressure is off by just a couple pounds, one or two pounds, that falls within spec. As long as the unit's operating normally, if you've checked it, your O2 levels are right, your flows are right, there's no alarms, but your pressure's just off by a couple pounds, the unit's still functioning normally. The high pressure, you always want to confirm high pressure by checking the operating pressure, see what the operating pressure is. You're going to check for flow restrictions in the exhaust muffler, disconnect the exhaust muffler, take it loose. It's located under the compressor. Uh, the unit's going to be loud, but if the issue high pressure goes away, then the problem is being caused by the muffler. Uh, your solenoid valves may not be cycling properly. Do the test on the valves, like we mentioned a few moments ago. Make sure the valves are operating as they should. And then high pressure, of course, could be caused by contaminated sieve beds. Go through the other issues first, then make it to the sieve beds last. A uh, compressor relief valve keeps going off on the unit. Could be a high pressure or a high pressure alarm that it's you know, accompanied by. Check for high pressure issues like we just covered. Check your electrical connections. Make sure you plug the valves in right. If you plug them in incorrectly, they may go off. <clears throat> uh, the feed valve may not be operating. So check the resistance and operation of the feed valves. If you get high pressure, it may not be letting the air prep pass from the compressor into the beds and it could just be a bad relief valve 
if it's going off when at a lower pressure then the relief valve itself may just be bad and need to be replaced next the flow meter is fluctuating more than a quarter of a liter per minute if that happens first thing you would do is look at the regulator uh, try to adjust it if not replace it or replace the regulator clean it or replace it uh, look for low pressure the cat the flow meter is calibrated to operate at 20 psi if we have low pressure in the system the flow is going to be off so that may be an issue of low pressure maybe a leak somewhere or something like that a weak compressor bad solenoid valves so go through all the steps for low pressure check those and then it could be just a bad flow meter they do go bad not very often but it does happen next you have limited or low flow from the system it could be restriction in the cannula or tubing or humidifier disconnect all that from the outside of the unit so you're checking just the bare outlet of the unit make sure there's nothing in there if it's humidifier bottle or a kink tube or a cannula or something like that could cause flow issues so you want to remove that first uh, you may need to adjust the regulator remember we need our uh, outlet pressure to be 20 psi make sure it's proper go through your low operating pressure steps low pressure calls low flow so go through all the things that cause low pressure the next it could be a restriction in the mixing tank replace the mixing tank as needed any questions on that <clears throat> Thank you very much for that, Cliff. Um, I think those troubleshooting tips were really, really helpful. Um, so we do have a few minutes left here. Uh, if we've got any questions, if while we're waiting, people, you can raise your hand to ask a question. You can put it in the chat. Um, don't be shy. Obviously, we have a great team here at um, CARE to support us with any questions. But while we're waiting, maybe for people to, oh, well, there we go. Jerry, question. Thanks, Summer Preet. Um, I was wondering, what do you actually put in the mixing tank, the product tank? Because I know some manufacturers just uh, leave it empty. Others put some some uh, more coarse granular zeolite in there. Uh, we don't. Uh, I can't really discuss exactly what's in there, but I do know there is some sieve inside of the the product tank. Yes, Jerry. Jerry, it's a it's a lithium based sieve that we use uh it's very similar to the uh the sieve that's used in the um the uh the uh sieve beds thank you much uh then we've got a chat a question in the chat from timothy does this unit have anything inbuilt to stop the user from setting flows higher than 10 liters per minute uh no the uh, flow meter, if they turn it past 10, it will exceed the 10 liter per minute range. Uh, and then it will get a, you'll start getting alarms for low O2 levels in this in the system. Got it. Thank you. Um, maybe a question from my side. What do you see as the most common failure on this unit in the field? Uh, pretty much as with any concentrator, the, the sieve beds tend to be, they're the part that do all of the work. So they tend to be the more common issue of any concentrator. Uh, beyond that, with this unit, um, I would say likely the uh, circuit board. This, um, these units are really resilient. They they run for long periods of time. Uh, sieve beds, like I say, are the, they're probably likely the number one issue with them. Uh, after that, then you would probably, I would, I would say likely it would be the circuit boards. Uh, the compressors tend to last a long time until it, they'll run a quite a long life on those. Thank you. Uh, Francis, you have your hand raised. All right. Um, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, you talked about cleaning the uh, the pressure regulator. How do you do that? How do you clean the pressure regulator? No, the pressure regulator, uh, the way the assembly goes together, it has a brass metal uh, base and then a bonnet that just tightens down onto that base. 
you'll loosen it up, take it loose. There's a, um, it's got a seal and a uh, diaphragm inside of there and a spring. And you just, as you take it apart, you'll notice the assembly that they go together. When it comes apart, you'll take the bonnet off and you'll see the spring and then the, the seal and the, ga and the um, diaphragm will come out. The only part really that you would ever clean would be the uh, diaphragm itself. And with that, you would just clean it with a lint-free cloth. Don't use any type of cleaning materials, um, no detergents, anything like that. Uh, don't put any lubrication on it. When you put it back together, just put it back together dry, put it all back together, and try it from there. Um, if you introduce anything into the unit at that point, any type of cleaners or lubricant, it can cause issues with the regulator and the unit itself. So, and you want to use a lint free cloth to keep any debris from getting in that valve and keeping it from closing. Um, does the cloth have to be damp or maybe just uh, dry? I'm, I'm sorry? Does the cloth has to be damp, like wait, slightly? Uh, just a dry cloth. A dry cloth oh. and just. Just wipe it off. Uh, remember that you are working with a, 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 a small rubber diaphragm. You don't want to pull on the diaphragm because that can cause it to misshapen. So you're just kind of wiping it off and uh, getting the any type of debris that might be on that, that regulator or diaphragm off. <clears throat> Majority of the time, um, it's replaced the diaphragm, but sometimes you can clean it and resolve the issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second question is for uh, earlier units, they only had one LED. And sometimes you, uh, you can be getting the purity correctly, like above 85%, but then you have the LED, the amber light flashing on and off uh, intermittently. Uh, what does that tell you? Or is there any problem or something? Okay, so you'll, you'll start the unit, you'll have normal O2 levels, but then as it wears on, as time goes on, it, the O2 levels will drop off. Is that what you're stating? The no, the O2 levels are like above eighty five percent, so it's no more O2 levels all along the way. But then you have the amber light flashing on and off. Okay, so if you have normal O2 levels, if you're checking your your O2 output and it's, say it's putting out ninety two, but you're getting an indicate alarm indicating low O2, then there's the, the small, there's a small um, O2 monitoring tube on the back of the unit right there at the board uh, that that component can go bad and that can cause the, the reading to be incorrect. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question from Kelvin. All right, thank you. Uh, my question is, I. You mentioned about uh, lithium-based zeolite in the mixing tank. So my question is, how is the nitrogen? I believe uh, zeolite works by absorbing nitrogen. So how is the uh, nitrogen in the mixing tank purged out of the system? Thank you. Uh, well, when it gets to the mixing tank, the nitrogen has been removed already. Uh, when it goes to the beds, it goes to the sieve beds first, the large sieve beds. We strip the nitrogen away there, and what you're left with coming out of the unit at that point is the uh, concentrated oxygen, argon, uh, other inert gases that might pass through with the oxygen. Um, so when it gets to the, uh, the mixing tank, the nitrogen should be gone already at that point. So... What's the use of the lithium zeolite in, this, uh, in the product tank? It's to help stabilize the O2 output because each bed, uh, let's say you know, it's got two beds, one on bed A and bed B. Bed A may produce a 92.1% oxygen. The other one points, the other one makes 92.6. We don't want those fluctuations in O2 coming out. Mix them in the tank. The the sieve inside of there helps to stabilize the O2 levels before it goes out of the product tank. So that when you measure it on the output of the unit, you have a fixed O2 level coming out of the unit. Okay, um, if we don't have, or Francis, do you have another question? And Mateo, I think we'll 
keep you for a few more minutes here, Cliff. Uh, oh, you're Francis, fine. Go ahead. Yeah, so my question is related to the oxygen sensor that you just mentioned. So I wanted to find out, I know the ASAP uses like the ultrasonic type oxygen sensor. Does it have like a lifespan? Because often we see it like the ASAP, when you measure with the oxygen analyzer, you're getting uh, the pure oxygen, like 95.6, but then the concentrator is showing you like low oxygen light. So does it have like a lifespan? Uh, not, we don't have any any type of lifespan on that component. Uh, and honestly, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. That's a good question uh, to be asked, but it's, we, we do not have a lifespan on that component, on any of our com components. There's too many variables, <clears throat> the condition of the environment, the units being used in, you know, is really extremely hot, extremely cold. Is there a lot of dirt, a lot of dust, a lot of animal dander? Uh, what's the condition of compressor, uh, the condition of the beds? There's a, a ton of variables in there that would affect all that stuff. And uh, yeah, we just, we don't have a lifespan because of all those variables. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, Francis, I think the last question is yours. All right, so I just wanted to ask uh, for the 8 liter and 10 liters models. They have the 2650 and 2660 compressors. Uh, is there any difference in the output pressures of these two compressors? Is there a difference in the outlet pressures, is that what you said? Yeah, like the maximum output pressures. Uh, are they the same or uh, are they different? Uh, is that, yeah. that is... A question that I, uh, I am unable to answer that question. Troy, do you know the answer to that one? Is Troy still with us? I think Troy dropped. Um, he may have Troy. dropped off. Um, I'll tell you what, if you can email me that question, I can get you a more definitive answer on that question. Um, we will do that. Yeah, if you'll you email that to me, I will get you an answer for that. Sounds very good. So thank you very, very much, Cliff, um, and the rest of the CARE team. Um, it was great having you guys here. We had a lot of questions, and um, I think your session was fantastic. So next week, we will return back to our regularly scheduled uh, concentrator talk programming where people can ask questions, um, and we will answer them. And we are getting really close to the end of the year. So this was our last auction talk, and thank you again very much to CARE. Have a great day.